then if you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 23 and verse 8. The scripture says, These are the names of David's mightiest warriors. The first was Jeshobim the Hakamite, who was leader of the three, the three mightiest warriors among David's men. He once used his spear to kill 800 enemy warriors in a single battle. Lord God, I thank you for this morning, for the, your grace and wisdom and your word. I pray you would have me to deliver it in the way you want it delivered. In your name, amen. To turn to the New Testament real quick, and then we'll be back in 2 Samuel for the rest of the message. Book of 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 6. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. There is a line I like from the classic western Fistful of Dollars. Clint Eastwood's character, man with no name, is asked, well, don't you admire peace? Isn't it something you look up to, something you strive for? And the famous poncho wearing quick draw replies, it's hard to admire something that you don't know anything about. And that's a very true statement. I think in this modern age, where we are so free from strife and difficulty, and don't really have to worry ourselves about being attacked on a personal level or having to be drafted into an armed service of some kind or enemy invasion or something as simple as getting eaten by wild animals again sudden spike in the bear population notwithstanding I think it'd be fair to say that a lot of the times we don't understand a lot of the martial talk and significance and stories from the Old Testament and I think we need to in order to understand a lot of the language and attitude of the New Testament. After all, phrases that you hear tossed around in church like prayer warrior or spiritual warfare don't mean a lot if you have no grasp of what spiritual warfare is or regular warfare. Calling yourself a soldier for Christ works a lot better when you comprehend what soldiers do. And we don't, more often than not. And it is a, not an accident, I should say, it is a concentrated effort. For whatever reason, about 50 years ago, this country of ours decided that we didn't like the young men who defended, that we would not care about them, that we would treat them like social pariahs, <coughs> that we would cast them off and let them stew and rot on street corners. Not that I'm very bitter about how this country treats veterans, but, you know, I am. Because it is a sin, I think, to mistreat your warriors, your soldiers, and to portray them as bad guys. All of this is much of what I have said before. This is not a sermon that is attempting to say anything new. You have heard several times from this pulpit a desire to see traditional masculinity held up in esteem again. But I don't think, by any stretch of the imagination, every new sermon needs to say something new. Sometimes it is just important to restate, clarify, and delve a little deeper into something you have said before. And I think the Old Testament provides us plenty of examples and people to look up to, and stories to remember and focus on. 
and we shouldn't ignore them just because they are uncouth by our very biased modern American standards. So back in 2 Samuel, to focus this morning on the 3 and 30. These are King David's three best warriors, and then his 30 best warriors. I don't know why the Bible makes this distinction, especially since at the end of the chapter, the biblical writer admits that in total there was 37 of them. So I don't understand why in the world they're called the 3 and 30, but whatever. The Bible goes on to say, verse 9, 2 Samuel 23, Next in rank among the three was Eleazar, son of Dodai, a descendant of Ahoah. Once Eleazar and David stood together against the Philistines when the entire Israelite army had fled. He killed Philistines until his hand was too tired to lift his sword, and the Lord gave him a great victory that day. The rest of the army did not return until it was time to collect the plunder. And here we see one of the many things you can learn from a secular or carnal or whatever word you prefer to use there. Warrior. And it is loyalty. Faithfulness. Sticking by your king or your commander or your pastor or whatever you want to put there. Even in times of great difficulty, when everyone else flees. And even when the rest of them come back after the fighting is over, or even after the spiritual fighting, or just the church work, you've been killing people with a sword or pulling weeds so long that your arm's ready to fall off, oh, and then suddenly everyone comes traipsing back, ready to help divide the spoils. But you don't focus on that. You don't look at that. You don't care about that. Because you are there because you are loyal. You are faithful. Verse 11 says, Next in rank was Shammah, son of Aji, from Harar. Half of this sermon is just because I want to say these names. They're fun to say. One time the Philistines gathered at Leha and attacked the Israelites in a field full of lentils. The Israelite army fled. But Shema held his ground in the middle of the field and beat back the Philistines. So the Lord brought a great victory. Another thing to learn from warriors, spiritual and physical, is of course courage. We have all heard at this point that bravery is not being unafraid, rather it is being afraid and doing the right thing anyways. This is not a fun situation to be in, obviously when everyone else runs away and you're suddenly left standing in a field of lentils facing down the enemy by yourself. But of course not, you're not by yourself. You are an Israeli warrior or a Christian prayer warrior and you are standing there with God. And I'm pretty sure he's bigger than any Philistine army the world can throw at you. So courage is important. Being brave, standing up against impossible odds, and trusting God to see you through. Verse 13 gives us an antidote about the three. Once during the harvest, when David was at the cave of Adullam, the Philistine army was camped in the valley of Rephim. The three, who were among the thirty, an elite group among David's fighting men, went down to meet him there. David was staying in the stronghold at the time, and a Philistine detachment had occupied the town of Bethlehem. David's home city, obviously of great importance to the king. David remarked longingly to his men, Oh, how I would love to see so, would love some of that good water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem. So the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew some water from the well by the gate of Bethlehem, and brought it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out as an offering to the Lord. The Lord forbid that I should drink this, he exclaimed. This water is as precious as the blood of these men who risked their lives to bring it to me. So David did not drink it. These are examples of the exploits of the three. And they are about the only exploits of the three we get in the entire Bible. These guys don't actually show up much. We hear a lot about David's men, just generalized. 
and a lot of David's exploits. And we get a good bit of Joab, David's general, who doesn't seem to have been included in his elite warriors. But this is just about the only time these guys show up. This is not Robin Hood and the Merry Men. They are not reoccurring characters who always get a couple lines in the background to remind you that they're there. But what we learn from them, and more importantly from David, is leadership. <laughs> well, it's first of all being careful about what you say when overeager uh, underlings are listening, because you can suddenly turn around and they've already accomplished something that you wanted to take your time and be careful with. Like, oh, I don't know, conquering a city to get a drink of water. But David clearly cares about his men, very careful, very, very much so. His own hometown is conquered and under danger, and it is his loyal fighting men who he cares so much about that he doesn't even drink the water. It's important if you ever find yourself in a leadership position to keep those who follow you foremost in your mind, to be utmost concerned with their well-being and what you have them do. The Bible continues to say in verse 18, Abishai, son of Zerah, the brother of Joab, was the leader of the 30. He once used his spear to kill 300 enemy warriors in a single battle. It was by such feats that he became as famous as the three. Abishai was the most famous of the 30 and was their commander, though he was not one of the three. And this is where I have to learn a lesson, because to my mind, to my cold, cynical, secular mind, a lot of this does sound fantastical, to put it lightly. Killed 300 men. That is a lot. To say that strains credulity is a understatement. 30 men would be easily believable, but 300? This is not John Wick. He does not have a gun or Hollywood bulletproof plot armor. This is not even a Roman soldier. This is a dude who has a weapons technology slightly better than pointy stick. When the Old Testament says sword, it means a bronze weapon that would be ridiculed as being hilariously out of date by the Roman army. And it's really hard to kill 300 people by yourself as a Roman soldier. My mind often wants to wonder if there wasn't some great translation era after all, and there is an extra zero in a couple of these verses. 800 men should be 80 men. 300 men should be 30 men. But that is a flaw in my reasoning and in my faith. As I like to remind people whenever they go a little overboard criticizing miracles, the fundamental belief of my religion is that a magic space wizard clapped his hands and created the universe. That, that's the ground floor. That is the basis, that this guy can create everything out of nothing, that he is all-powerful, that he can do whatever he wants, and suddenly I have doubts and questions in my faith because of an unrealistic battle report? Really? <laughs> that, uh, that makes me the crazy one frankly. That makes me the one who needs to stop and take a look and reassess a couple of my preconceived notions. Because, of course, a soldier for God, whether through actual weapons or prayer, is capable of far greater miracles than this. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. I'm pretty sure that's harder than uh, killing 300 guys. And after all, if secular kings can build mountains, surely Christians can take them down with the power of God on their side. So, the last character to go over this morning, we have had Jeshobim, Eleazar, Shema, and Abisha. We finish in verse 20 with Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warrior from Kebezel. He did many heroic deeds, which included killing two champions of Moab. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. 
Once armed only with a club, he killed an imposing Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. Benaiah wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with it. Deeds like these made Benaiah as famous as the three mightiest warriors. He was more honored than the other members of the Thirty, though he was not one of the three. And David made him captain of his bodyguard. And this is the final lesson you can learn this morning, both from these verses and from our own fighting men, is, of course, humility. This guy's exploits sound cooler than the other guy's. Woo, you got 300 people in the middle of a field. That's nice. I went into a snow pit and killed a lion. How about that? That sounds way cooler. But this guy doesn't get promoted to the three. He doesn't get to lead the 30. He is instead given the relatively humble, but of course incredibly important role of David's personal bodyguard. A role that, as we have had first-hand experience in the last couple weeks, often means jumping between the person you're guarding and danger with no regard for your own life. It is the ultimate quiet, thankless role, but an indispensable one. And that is much the true for many of the same jobs in the church. I will continue to hold that piano players and lunch cookers actually do more work than I do for Sunday services. And it is these roles that are oftentimes much less glamorous and honored that keep the world spinning, that keep churches functioning and keep armies marching. So it's important to remember this morning, all of these things you can learn both from many of the Old Testament passages and from just a little appreciation for those who we owe our freedom to. Loyalty, courage, faith, friendship, humility, it's all there and it's all good. So before we dismiss this morning, is there anything else we need to pray about? Alright then, if Grandfather would dismiss us and bless the food, Loving Father, we are blessed this morning that we can gather together in your house and worship you and have fellowship and just be a part of your kingdom. And I just pray this morning as we dismiss that you bless the food that we partake of and bless the fellowship that we have together over this meal. So just be with us, Lord, and uh, keep us safe and sound as we travel home. Bring us back at the appointed time that we enjoy this experience again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Do you guys have a lunch planned? I was going to.